All right. Awesome. There we go. Okay, so if you are a first-timer or if you've been part of church for a while and you want to connect with us on a deeper level, maybe uh, form part of the church or just get to know us better, I'm going to ask you to scan this barcode um, on the screen. So this is your con virtual connect card. So there you can just fill in your details. I'll be receiving a message and then I'll be following up with you uh, to maybe schedule a coffee or have a good chat with either with me or some of our leaders. So if you're here for a first time and you want to get to know our church better, um, you guys are welcome to scan that barcode. Otherwise, we have physical connect cards as well. So if you see me after the church, you can just come to me and tell me, hey, I want to fill in a connect card, then I can give you one that you can fill in and then just hand back to me. All right, so that is the connect card. Uh, that's the first announcement. Our second announcement. So if you guys are students around you and you guys are planning on joining our services more regularly or you are joining our services more regularly, um, I want to encourage you guys to scan this barcode. This is just for information, okay? This is just a platform that we want to use to communicate with you guys. We won't be spamming you with anything else except for information regarding our services here at Chef Poch. Okay, so this is more like tailored for, for the students. So I want to encourage you guys, if you guys missed that barcode, you guys are welcome to go onto our social media platforms where you can find that link and scan or just into that WhatsApp group. Awesome. So that is the announcements group. And then just the regular ones for this week, we have Recharge, our intercession, um, just where we pray and worship together as a congregation on Tuesday mornings from 6 to 7, right here in the auditorium. So I want to encourage you guys to come out nice and early, okay? Um, it's really a very sacred part of our week where we as church gather and just seek Jesus' face. Okay, special things happen when we enter into God's presence as a unit, um, in unity. All right, so I want to encourage you guys to come to intercession, to recharge, Tuesday morning from 6 to 7, right here in the auditorium. Uh, the second thing we have is small group connect. Okay, so if you want to form part of a small group, we encourage you guys to come and join us for Connect. That's where we start telling you more about what small group is, what our heart for small group, for small group is, and we slot you into community um, like that. Awesome. And then the third one is our street evangelism group. So if you want to join, or I actually want to encourage you guys to join the street evangelism group. Evangelism group. So we have groups going out most days of the week, uh, either onto the build or certain parts of town, where we just go and evangelize. So we share God's love. We pray for people. We just, we just love people. Okay, so I want to encourage you guys, scan this barcode, go onto that WhatsApp group, and just follow the prompts on that group. Okay, some of you might feel, no, this is not for me necessarily, but we are all called to reach out to people and to love people, okay, even though it might feel uncomfortable. All right, and then something that's awesome, that's very big on our calendar, is our Let's Go missions. So can I see by a raise of hands, has any of you ever been on a mission before, an outreach? Okay, so here's a couple of us. Um, hopefully we can change this percentage after the June, July holidays. All right, so missions, missions is very big and a very big part of our heart and part of our show for our DNA. Okay, I mentioned previously that um, congregations such as Stellenbosch send out up to 90 teams a year. Um, to certain network churches and communities that are affiliated with Shofar. Okay, so that's a really big part of our heart as Shofar Church to go on outreach and to reach out um, as we see it part of our, our great commandment. Okay, so we have five locations that we will be going out. You can go into the previous slide, please. Um, five locations that we'll be visiting this year during the June, July holidays. So the first one will be Live Village. So if you guys have a little notebook or, or your phone, you guys want to take notes regarding the, ve the destination and the dates, this will be a good time to do that, okay, for those of you who haven't signed up. Okay, so we'll go be going to Live Village, which is in KZN, okay, I'm um, not going to elaborate too much on that now, you guys can Google that as well, awesome initiative that they're running there in KZN Natal, that it will be from the 11th to the 18th of July, okay, that will be Live Village. The second one we have on our list is Namibia, more specifically, we'll be reaching out to Swakopmund. Okay, they'll be ministering around the schools predominantly, if I'm not mistaken. And that will be taking place between the 8th and the 17th of July. 8th and 17th July, that is Namibia. Okay, and then the third one is Mozambique. Um, so this will be taking place between, anywhere between the 24th of June and the 4th of July. So there's just a little bit of, um, a, lot, lot, a couple of... Um, 
arrangements that they still need to make to solidify that, but it'll be in that range, 24 June to, to 4 July, that is Mozambique. And then we have Secunda in Mpumalanga from the 16th to the 23rd of July, and then Tanin will be taking place early July. All right, we'll be expecting to um, hear about that date uh, in the beginning of next week, this week, coming, this coming week. Okay, so that, are, that is our five destinations. I want to encourage you guys, go onto our social media platforms, sign up, okay? You can go into our link um, on our show for pages, sign up, join, join a mission. Uh, it is life-changing. It's an awesome opportunity to reach out. Okay, awesome. Then something that's huge on our calendar for this week is Freedom Week. Okay, so we will be having Encounter 3 and Encounter 4, um, which will be dealing with, with destiny, more specifically, inner healing. Okay, this will be Encounter 3. And then we have our Encounter 4, we'll be, we'll be talking about freedom and deliverance. Okay, so this is really exciting. We've got a team coming up from, from George, all the way from the, from the Southern Cape there. And this is going to be an awesome opportunity. Okay, so I want to encourage you guys, jump onto that link tonight and register for this. Okay, um, my life is a testimony of, of, of partaking in things as such and really being liberated by the power of Jesus Christ. Okay, so lots of us here have, have been through this process and it's been so liberating. Okay, so I want to encourage you guys, come join Freedom Week next week. It's going to be awesome. All right. And then serving teams, okay, we need hands to see that church happens. Okay, I know this week might have been a tough week with, with, uh, with semester tests and, and all these things going on, but we want to encourage you guys to sign up, okay? We don't just come to church to receive, okay? That's a very, very um, ill culture within our generation, just having this consumer culture, okay? So I want to encourage you guys, if you guys call this home and you guys come in week out, week in, week out, let's raise our hands to help serve. Okay, so I want to encourage you guys, um, scan this barcode or go onto our social media platforms, get more information regarding this, and just sign up for a team. Okay, feel our undermark, lichte werk, like the Afrikaner says. Okay, so please join us, join us with, with that. Awesome. All right, it's time for our offering. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for a corporate gathering as, as such, Lord. May what we bring here tonight just glorify your name and honor your name, Father. Father, in that same vein, we just want to pray for our finances specifically and just our heart of giving, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll come do a deep work in our heart to see your heart regarding just offering and, and giving and, and tithing, Lord. So, Father, we come and we bring our offering to you tonight, and we pray that it would be a sweet aroma unto you, Lord. Lord, may it glorify your name, Lord, and may it build your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that we can partake in, in something as, as the kingdom of God and to, to labor alongside you, Jesus. So thank you, Lord, that we, can, we have the opportunity to bring our offering to you tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Awesome, guys. So the, the ushers will be coming around with the offering boxes. You guys are welcome to deposit the cash in there. Otherwise, these are... that. Those are our, um, our information of our bank accounts. You guys can snap scan as well. You guys must enjoy the service with us tonight. to stand with us. <laughs> this evening, our heart for the worship is to just look upon Jesus, to behold him. He says he is the way, the truth, and the life. So, we are going to fix our eyes on him tonight, so that we first of all may know the truth, and secondly, we pray that the Holy Spirit would give us the courage and the boldness to proclaim that truth and to receive his truth. 
to actually know the heart of the Father and to share that with the world. So Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you that you want to meet us here. Thank you that you do not leave us in the darkness. Thank you for all that you have done. Just so that we can be close to you. So this evening we pray that you would draw us close. As we draw near to you, may you draw near to us. You are so worthy to be praised and with all of heaven, with all of the angels, with all of creation, we will say you are worthy to receive all the honor, all the glory, all the power. Now into eternity. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your name. I sing praises to
better than anything else that we have ever seen or tasted better than anything else that we know so we give
give our lives to you as a living sacrifice because you are so worthy of everything that we can give. So we pray, Holy Spirit, come and speak with us tonight. May your truth find its home in our hearts. Come and prepare the soil of our hearts. May it be fertile ground where the truth of your word can can fall and may bear much fruit in our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. your seats. Thank you, worship team. Can we just give the Lord a round of applause? What a privilege. On him. Awesome. So it's my privilege tonight to introduce our guest um, preacher, I'd say. Um, so Professor Reitzer Rotset, if you could just come on the stage. That would be awesome. All right. So we got a the prediker right out of Maritzburg. In KZN, it's come a long way, so it was um, our privilege to listen to um, you know, just awesome stuff that he shared. He was one of the lecturers or one of the speakers at the conference this weekend. So, um, yeah, we just want to honor you, sir, for the work that you do. And I'm not necessarily going to read his resume to you. I think he can just tell a bit more about himself when he gets, when he gets going. So, yeah, if you guys don't mind, if you stretch out your hands and so we can pray for him um, before we get going. Lord, thank you for, for this moment. Thank you, Lord, that we can just... Pray for, for right to now, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that what he does to honor your name may be less about him and more about you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, for this uh, opportunity to come and speak to you tonight. We're all up and ready to go. Great. So, as you've heard, um, I'm from Peter Maritzburg. Yeah. Here we go. Great. And um, I'm English, though I actually throw it on a boerennoi, so Afrikaans is the taal van liefde daar by my. Um, I'm going to be doing this talk in English, though. I'm an anesthesiologist, a narcotiseer, I'm a critical care subspecialist, I'm um, being attacked from the front. I'm um, a bit of a clinical researcher, a little bit of a research nerd. I'm affiliated with the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and I'm busy with a master's in Christian apologetics and philosophy. I love the Lord, and it's been a great opportunity to spend time with you guys over this weekend. I'm going to be speaking to you about the heart of God. But before we do that, it's Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to any mothers that are over here. It's been quite an experience, and I'll, you'll understand why, seeing my wife as a mother, there's a depth of character and strength and just the amazingness that I never appreciated in the 15, 16 years that we'd been married before we had children. This Calvin and Hobbes um, cartoon sort of captures that. Hobbes, look, there's a little raccoon on the ground. Is it alive? I think so. He's hurt. He's hardly breathing. Better not touch him if he's hurt. Yeah, you wait. Um, here and guard him and I'll run and get mom. I'm sure she can help. Of course she can. You don't get to be mom if you can't fix everything just right. Maybe at the moment you're sweating bullets because you forgot to get your mom a gift. Or you forgot to give a gift for your wife. I just want to say that before we had kids, Mother's Day was an incredibly painful moment for us because we'd been trying to have children. And I remember those Mother's Days when mothers were asked to stand. I don't know if you've lost your mother. Maybe you could have been a mother, but through your decisions you chose not to be a mother. I just want to let you know that God's heart is for you. How can I stand up here and say that I know what the heart of God is? Of course, I'm only going to be explaining or exploring a small component of what that means. And I want to go back to this image. Why is it not enough to say to your wife or to your mom, but I love you? What didn't you do? You didn't get her a gift. Because it is easy to say something, but the proof of the pudding is when you do it. 
And just so that you know, I actually remembered. T.S. Eliot writes in a poem called The Hollow Men, this passage that I've always really found quite profound. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. He was a Christian. Captures that. That's why your mom or your wife is upset with you. Because between what you think and what you did, there is a shadow. So how do we know what God's heart is? Let's go to the scriptures. 1 John 7, verse, uh, 4, verse 7 to 10. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. But how do we know that God is love? Where is the proof of God's love? I'm so glad you asked. God showed us how much he loved us by sending, by doing, by acting his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. He stepped up to the plate. He put skin in the game. He gave his most precious for us. I bought my wife flowers. He gave everything so that we should know this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Unique. Among all religions, among all philosophies, he acted. Psalm 1 to 7, how good to sing praises to our God as we have done today. How good, delightful, how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding. He is bringing, he is healing. He heals the brokenhearted, he bandages the words. He does, he acts. The ultimate expression of this love, for God so loved the world. Finished, no. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The heart of God is the gospel. The heart of God is Jesus Christ. Come, died, and risen for you. That is the core of the gospel. That is the core of God's heart. Why did he do that? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You are out there, and he brings you in here. Ephesians 1 says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. What a cool line. Hey? He wanted to do it because it gave him great pleasure. And he decided that no matter where you were, if you came to him, he would adopt you from the outside into that family. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us to belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Romans 8.14 For those who are led by the Spirit are the children of of God, no longer on the outside, on the inside. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption into sonship. You have been taken and you're part of his family. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Sometimes translated as Daddy, but actually more intimate. Father, Father, my Father. Great father of mine. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, it goes into like a trust, those kids are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And this is the way it was with you before Christ came. We we're like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God acted and he sent his son, born of a woman subject to the law. 
God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Father, my Father, Abba Father. Now you're no longer a slave, but God's own child. Adoption is the heart of the gospel. This is a Hebrew phrase, selah. Because in the, in the Psalms, it's like, take a moment and just think about that. Think about what he's done, acted. Think about his aim, his heart, is to adopt you. Praise him for that. But of course he is God, and there's more to his heart. What else is in the heart of God? God is the father of the fatherless. The protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. He has a heart for the vulnerable, for the weak, for those that are isolated, those that have fatherless, for the unborn. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the traveler, giving him food and clothing. You have searched me, Lord, you know me. You know me when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know completely. You hear me in behind and before you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. For you created me. You created my most innermost being. You knit me, you formed me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know full well my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place in the womb, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, Lord. Today, through some cool science, we can have a little bit of that image of God. This one's going to run. No. What is that? Anybody? Oh, it's an elephant. Have a look at that thing. It's an elephant embryo. How amazing is that, eh? Check that it's a little trunk. What's this? Huh? A cat, yes. It's a cat embryo. Look at it developing, going through this. You happy with the cat, yeah? What's this? At the top, dog, it's actually a mouse. At the bottom, at the bottom, a human. It's a human embryo. So you look at these things and you can see from the beginning, this one is an embryo, but it's an elephant embryo. And the other one is a cat embryo. And the other one at the top is a mouse embryo. And the one at the bottom is a human embryo. It is a human embryo. They've had a survey in which one PhD student asked 1,300 biologists across the world, when does life start? And how many think said it starts at the moment of conception? 96%. God says he knew you, he formed you in that innermost secret place. He put you together. I'm going to come out. I want to show you this. Because I really worked hard on it to make sure it worked. Sorry guys, will you quickly come and help me to get it projected? It's going to be a needy thing, basically. How's I? So why is the pastor? Thank you. This is a fetoscopy. 
This woman is about to lose the baby because she's got cancer and she's going to have chemotherapy. They put a small camera down through the umbilical cord, shining light onto a nine-week-old child. Nierge nine weeks. You can see his hands, the face. He's not hiding his face from the land, but that's how he's floating in utero. His umbilical cord. What is it? What is it? It's a human. It's nine weeks. The German Constitutional Court, in their ruling on abortion, writes that the life which is developing in the womb of the mother is an independent legal value which enjoys the protection of the Constitution. The state's duty to protect forbids not only direct state attacks against the life developing itself, but also requires the state to protect and foster this life even against the mother. Why is that significant? Because the Germans have this history, it's 1975 that they write this, of the atrocities committed against people, against humanity. And so they recognize in their law what we all know, that this is life, that this is human life, it is worthy. They write human life, unborn human life is developing as a human being, as you identified, a human embryo, not towards being a human being. The unborn human is a human from conception, scientific, visually, in terms of law. Now, if the unborn is not a human being, then when we come to abortion, you can kill it, and you need not justify it. Just do it. When my son shouts to me, Dad, there's a cockroach under the bed. Can I kill it? Yasian. <laughs> Those things are creepy. Kill it. If what is in, the, is in the uterus is not human, who cares? But if the unborn is a human being, no justification is adequate. Because if it is a human being, under what circumstances can you kill it? Because any excuse that you use to kill this human being in the uterus is the same excuse that you can use to kill the baby that has just been born. If the unborn is not a human being, no justification is necessary. If the unborn is a human being, no justification is adequate. But what about the arguments? You know, if we, if we ban abortion, then backstreet abortions will increase. Yeah, but that is a decision of the mother that she takes. The only thing that she's being, she isn't forced to have that abortion. The only thing that she's being forced to do is not kill a human being. That's the only issue. If she chooses to do something, if that choice in some way harms her as she tries to kill the child, what has that got to do with that innocent nine-week-old child? In South African law, without even talking to anybody, you can have abortion before the age of, uh, before 12 weeks, and 20 weeks with, um, with con well, with the help of the state, if you've got a reason. Nine weeks. Women have the, a right to privacy with their doctor. What they do between a doctor and a woman the, is, is their thing. State has no right there. Well, that doesn't make sense at all, because no privacy argument is adequate to justify harming or killing an innocent human being. If I choose with my doctor to collude to murder somebody, to commit sexual assault on somebody, the right to safety and life of the person I wish to attack trumps my right to privacy. Because it is human. Women should have freedom to choose. Yes, they should. But nobody has open-ended freedom to choose anything they want. You only have the choice to choose morally acceptable choices, alternatives. I do not have the right to strip down nude and walk through Poch's main street. It's my body, I'll do with what I want. No, that's morally unacceptable. 
I do not have the right to ride at 160 kilometers per hour down this road past Chimis, because it's my right. <laughs> Killing innocent children because they are inconvenient is not a morally acceptable alternative, just because I don't want it. It's my body, it's my choice. Yes, but the law does not allow you to do whatever you want with your body. And, and there are two human beings involved. What about the rights of the woman in utero? What about her rights? Is the unborn child the property of the mother that you can do with it whatever you want? When we look at the history of society and we start talking about humans that are owned by other humans, we start talking about slavery. The Dred Scott ruling in the US which denied African Americans their actual humanity. Hutu and Tutsu in Rwanda took away the humanity of their opponents and called them cockroaches. That's what you start looking at. What about the unwanted children shouldn't be allowed to come into the world? They cost a lot of money. Nobody's going to look after them. They're just a drain on society. Well, first, the kid is already in the world. It is there. And second, if you don't want it, you just if you don't want something, do you just kill it? Is that how we treat anybody else? Any other human? What about, you know, I'm just a bloke and I'm insensitive to the suffering of women, to the circumstances, the things that would happen to them. Let's accept that argument and call me an insensitive individual. So what? What is that, my insensitivity, got to do with the humanity of that little child in utero? The heart of God is the unborn child. So think about that for a little bit. Reflect on it. Remember that you were once a fetus. And if that is true, abortion is unjustifiable. Adoption is the heart of God. And here, I'm just going to get all gratuitous and show you photos of my family. So this is my wife, me, and my two boys, Joshua and Nathan. They are six and four. This is what it looks like when it's not a staged photo. It's chaos. Now, adoption is a story of pain and of loss. Why do I say that? Because my wife and I, this is us getting married. What a lucky guy. Eh? It's full of dreams, full of plans, full of stuff, full of ourselves, because we are doctors and we're going to be really important and we run around studying stuff and researching and traveling the world because, you know, we're so busy and kids are a bit of a waste and they're difficult and they're a little bit of a... And then one day, so about 35, my wife and I like realized, yeah, we actually want kids. Up until then we said, we'll never have kids. And so we start trying to have kids, and it doesn't happen. We come back from overseas, and we start trying IVF. And when we started crying on the way down for the next failed round of IVF, we said, it's genoeg. We need to do something else. This is my son's. One in the baby home, one in the hospital. They don't know who their parents are. They will never know who their parents are. They will always ask, why, what? There's this slayer, there's this point at which they will have no information ever. When it comes to Mother's Day, they will thank and praise my wife for being their mother, but they will always ask, I wonder what my mom, my biological mom is doing. When they get married, when they have children, and they feel these sensations and this sense of love towards their children, they will always be asking, what now? Where's my mom? How could she give me up if I feel like this? But adoption is a story of love. This is the first time I met Josh, and he hijacked my hat. And he still tells us about how he took daddy's hat. And then he came home with us. That's his turtle. And then he got a brother. And now they are the brothers doing their thing. Check the turtle there at the bottom. You see him? He's a little bit gray and a little bit dirty, and, but he's still there. Adoption is costly. It costs money. You know, you've got to pay for these kids. They eat a lot. You've got to educate them. It costs you emotionally. 
I remember crying out of frustration trying to get the variation order changed so that Josh could come home with us. Driving around the city to try and find somebody that was open, going into um, home affairs offices, just trying to get somebody to sign the stupid documents so they could come home with me. It's emotional because I love him and I'm scared something's going to happen to him. And it takes time. You know, to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and then they call for my wife, and then I turn over and then she goes out. I tried. My youngest says, no, I want mom. Amen. <laughs> Adoption is legal, and it's forever. I don't know if you know this, but when you adopt a child formally, the kid gets a new name, but he gets a new ID number, and he's mine. I don't care what you say, he's my child. Here's Josh's name. It was Joshua jo uh, Joseph Ritzes Matlatsi, and now it's Joseph Joseph Rotseth. I'm a Rotseth. He's a Rotseth. And his ID number changed. I think it's super cool. Adoption is a spiritual blessing. I mean, it's fun. And just being in a family is an amazing experience. We eat ice cream together. We go catching crabs with the braces. But it has shown me the heart of the Father. It has made me aware of what, just a little bit of what God feels about us. And if you know, I feel this sensation towards my family. What does he feel about you? What would I do for my son? What did he do for you? Adoption creates heirs, inheritors. One day, they will get my wealth. They will get my knife collection. I've got a knife collection issue. They will also inherit one of the greatest earthly gifts that I can give to them, Supporting the sharks. <laughs> but they will also inherit the values that we have in our home. As we talk about what it means to be a servant and a warrior and somebody who is wise. And I pray, not that they would inherit, but that they would know Jesus Christ. Adoption is planned and purposeful. My wife and I sat down and said, are we going to do this? We're going to do this. And we got going. We went through the training. We went to the social workers, home inspections. We got copies of all of our stuff, police clearances. We went to made applications and applications and wrote a baby, like a book that explains who we are and where we're going from, and put it on a ray cap and waited and talked and waited. And what did they do? Nothing. They just sat there looking cute. We chose to adopt them. We planned it. It was a purposeful decision. Adoption is a story of redemption from our loneliness, our emptiness in the home, from their murder, their death. I have so much um, like amazement at the women that carried our children in the circumstances that they were and did not have an abortion. The bravery, the commitment that they did, that these two kids could have life. They were redeemed from poverty. And if you look at those arguments to have killed my kids, these two little boys, because they will have nothing, nobody wants them, they'll grow up in poverty, and now they're sitting in my home in Peter Maritzburg, eating, going to private schools, loved. Who are you to say that they have not a chance in life? Just think about that. But what we do as humans is a reflection of what God has done for us. Because God's adoption for us is a story of pain and loss. Our pain and loss of our self-autonomy and our arrogance in the way that we live our lives. And his pain and loss in the death on the cross that God sent his son to die for us. But above all, it is a story of love. Because he loved us, that he acted and sent his son, that you can come into the kingdom, that you can come into the family. It is costly. It cost him everything. He died. It was planned. and It was purposeful. He chose to do this. What did we do? 
next knee. We didn't even look cute. <laughs> he chose beforehand to send his son to die for you. It makes us heirs of the greatest kingdom ever. We are in the awesomest family of all, with the greatest father as we have sung. It is a blessing in our lives. It is the greatest blessing. It's a story of redemption from death, eternal death, and eternal poverty. That is something to think about. I just want to ask the worship team to come up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Today, you may be sitting here and you don't know you're not part of this family of God. And you say, I don't know if I can trust you. Do you really love me? I want to say, look at what he did. You can trust him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. If you are following him in your honest family, it is not enough just to see Jesus clearly, to see the Lord and understand him. We see so that we may act. We are called to bear fruit. We are called to act, to do. If you maybe are in a place where one time in your life you felt that you couldn't carry this pregnancy to term and you sit with a sense of shame and of loss in your life, realize that God has a plan for you too and wishes to redeem that and to adopt you into the family. There is space in God's heart for forgiveness. It's not something that you have to carry for yourself. If you've thought some of these ideas that it might be better for the child just to die, I want to challenge you again by the things that I have said to realize the value of the life that is in you. In this congregation, there, have been, there has been an adoption. It's going to be an adoption. And I would encourage you as Christians to have that mindset of adoption. And if God touches it on your heart, to do so. To support those that have made that ultimate step to adopt children, to support children. In the ancient Roman times, they would take unwanted children, throw them to the ground because they didn't want them. And Christians were known by the fact that they would love them and they would go and collect them. South Africa is bursting at the seams with unwanted children. Let us be known, let this church be known, let this denomination be known as people who adopt, who represent and reflect the heart of God. I'm going to pray now. If anything that I've said today has touched your heart, be it around your relationship with Jesus Christ, the things that you want to confess in your life or need healing from, or even just in a desire to partner or to step up and to say to the Lord, this is something that I want to do. I'm going to ask you to come forward. The elders will be here. We can pray with you. I'm going to pray now. So if we can just, just bow our heads. Father God, what an awesome privilege. Father, thank you that you loved us before the beginning of time, Father. That you called us to be your sons. Father, thank you for this great privilege. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for that action that you've done. Father, I pray that those that do not know you yet, that standing outside the family would see the heart of the Father, one of love. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So I pray that they would come to you, that they accept you into their life, Lord. For, Lord, for those of us that are in this moment, Jesus, that we would realize that it's not just enough to say yes but that we need to stand up, act and do. But I want to commend the church, this church in particular, in the way that it is acting out your word and engaging with the people around us. Lord, that there's an active living testimony to the love of Jesus Christ by what it does. I pray that that would continue, that your spirit would continue to fill this church, fill its people, fill these students with a love that is actioned. Father, for those that have suffered, that have lost have given up this child through circumstances that have had an abortion, Father, we pray for healing. You are not alone. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. 
for the Father loved you so much that he gave his only son. And Father, I pray that this church, that the church at large would be known as a church that adopts, brings in the lost, brings in the orphans, brings in those that have no homes. Father, that this playground outside here would be overflowing with children and that this church would be a place of love and of happiness to your glory. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us. And if you feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, or God is calling you to do something regarding the orphans and the widows, please come to the front so that Christu or Kilian or Reiter or Simon or Andri can pray with you.